Hey everyone, today I wanted to share with you a really cool opportunity that I had to uh, demonstrate a bit of technology that I learned about recently while I was doing research for my next video, which is going to be on nitrogen. So I came across a company called Generon, and they specialize in gas separation technologies. And from them, I learned about this technology that's called a nitrogen membrane filter. And I asked a little bit about it, you know, how it works, that sort of thing. And they actually ended up sending me an entire nitrogen membrane module uh, for me to try out, which is really cool. So I'm very excited to get to use this and show you guys how it works. So we'll talk a little bit about how this technology actually works. And then I'll, I'll take you out to the garage and set everything up and we'll give it a shot. The Generon membrane filter allows us to filter oxygen out of compressed air and outputs a stream of nitrogen gas with adjustable purity. This particular model can go up to 99.5% purity, or about 0.5% oxygen left. The air we breathe is made up of about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other gases, and of that 1%, it's actually mostly argon, it's 0.93% and the remainder being trace gases like carbon dioxide, krypton, neon, things like that. So if we can separate out that oxygen, we can end up with very pure nitrogen for use in inert atmosphere work or as a feedstock to like a liquid nitrogen system, for example. Now what I have here is their Model 210 module, which I believe is the smallest they offer. These can get much larger for use in industrial setups, but I got a small one just to test it out. The way it works is very simple. You pass compressed air into this end, the inlet. It then passes through the filter module and purified nitrogen exits out the other end. The oxygen that got filtered off then exits out through this side port here. The way it does this is the inside of the module is filled with a lot of tiny hollow fibers, which you can visualize as a bundle of straws. Now the real fibers inside the module are really tiny. Uh, this one module has about 40,000 of them in there. So that gives a huge surface area to maximize filtration efficiency. The fibers are made of a material that allows oxygen gas to permeate through it at a faster rate than nitrogen gas does. So the compressed air is passed through these fibers and the oxygen preferentially passes through the walls of the fibers while the nitrogen continues on down the length of them. These fibers go through two solid plates, which you can kind of visualize as these rubber bands here, so that the oxygen that permeates through them is collected in this central region. The model I have here actually has this outer casing around it, and that allows me to collect that filtered oxygen through this output port on the side here. And that actually opens up a lot of other possibilities if you want to use that stream for experiments that could use enriched oxygen. And it's not pure oxygen, because some nitrogen does still make it through the fibers, but it is at a higher concentration than air, which I hope to show later on. The two streams of gases that this separates the air into have two different names. The stream that permeates through the fibers and comes out this sidewall here is called the permeate stream. And you can see it's written on here. This is the permeate vent. The other stream that continues on through it that is retained inside the fibers is called the retentate stream, and that's going to be your purified nitrogen gas that comes out the other end. They're also nice enough to include this needle valve on the end as well, which is an important piece because that is what allows you to control the nitrogen's purity. Now, the purity is based on the gas's residence time in the filter fibers. So if you didn't have this valve, the input air would just fly straight through the fibers and out the other end, and it wouldn't spend a lot of time in contact with the fiber material, and so the oxygen would get kind of washed out with the nitrogen and, and you would get low purity. By restricting the flow using this valve here, it slows the gas down so it spends more time in contact with the fibers, and thus more oxygen can be filtered out. And that results in a bit of a trade-off. So if you want high purity nitrogen, you have to restrict the flow and thus have a slower output flow rate. One more thing I wanted to point out, since it's new to me, are the ports for these gases. These are called swage lock fittings, and they're sort of the reverse of a hose barb. Um, your tubing actually goes inside them, and then this gets uh, screwed onto a compression fitting that then makes it gas tight. The advantage of using this is that it's, it's good for high pressure applications. 
since you don't risk the hose popping off the hose barb if the pressure gets too high. So it turns out this is actually a, a much more secure way to do this sort of thing. Finally, I think it's important to note that this technology is meant to filter out oxygen. So other atmospheric trace gases that we mentioned before could still make it through. So when we say we're producing 99% nitrogen, what that really means is that there's a 1% oxygen in the output stream. Your actual nitrogen purity would be more like 98% since you've got that 1% of argon that, that might stay with it. But you know, for most applications that really doesn't matter because if your goal is an inert atmosphere, 1% of another inert gas is not going to make a difference. It's still something to be aware of though. This entire module, minus the needle valve, costs about $500. To set up the full system that I'll show you in a minute, I spent about $300 myself. But once you get it set up, it's extremely simple to use and it's just about free to run since you just need air. There's no moving parts, and if you set up your input air as they recommend, which I'll talk about in a minute, there's little to no maintenance, and the module can last for upwards of 10 years. So that's a brief overview of how this thing works. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, I'll put some links in the description, and I think the patents especially are, are really interesting. So now we're out in my garage, and I've got everything set up. Just to do a brief overview, I've got compressed air cylinder here, which goes to regulator. Uh, goes through this tubing to the input of the membrane filter. That will then filter the air into two streams. The oxygen stream, uh, which is the permeate gas, is going to come out here, and then that is led out, uh, out my garage door, so far away from any ignition sources. Um, then the retentate stream, uh, the pur purified nitrogen gas, is going to come out this uh, side over here through the valve, which then goes through this tube to the bottom of a flow meter, and then the output of the flow meter then goes to an open tube, which leads into an open test tube for collection. So here's the first piece in the system. This is a size 200 compressed air cylinder that I bought from my local air gas store, and that's attached to a regulator, which I also bought from air gas. And then if we come around to the back of the tank, you can see that it is, in fact, compressed air. By the way, you can use any source of compressed air for your input. I'm using a cylinder because that's the easiest for me. You can use an air compressor, but if you do that, there's a lot of pretreatment steps that you need to take to condition your input air to help improve the lifetime of the filter. So you want to get rid of oils and moisture and things like that. And if that's the type of system you want to use, there's plenty of documentation saying what all you need to do in the pretreatment. At the feed end of our module, we've got compressed air coming in this side and traveling through the filter, and then the permeate gas, the oxygen, is going to flow out here, and this is a very long tube that goes to the outside uh, to vent it well away from any ignition sources because it's enriched oxygen. You also notice that I've strapped the module down to a piece of wood. Uh, that's just to prevent it from rolling away. So these are very, very loose straps, and there's uh, some foam in there to stop it from scratching it. So here at the output side of the filter, the purified nitrogen gas is going to flow through this needle valve through a tube, which loops around and comes to the bottom of our flow meter here. I have a flow meter installed um, because I want to be able to, to determine the purity of the gas that's coming out. And honestly, as an amateur without analysis equipment, I really can't tell the difference between 95% and 99% nitrogen. But luckily for me, there is a document on the Generon website, which I'll link to as well, that has some specs for the 210 module here. And it actually relates purity of the output to flow rate. So the chart says that if our output gas is at 95% purity, it's going to flow out at 18.9 cubic feet per hour. And then if we're at 99.5% purity, uh, it should flow out at 5.9 cubic feet per hour. So there's a pretty big difference between the flow rates between low and high purity. So to demonstrate that, we'll turn the compressed air source on up to 100 PSI. And you'll see the little ball in this flow meter has risen up. So that's how this thing works, is there's a little ball in there, and when air comes in from the bottom, it forces that little ball up to a certain level, and then whatever level it hovers at is what you read it at. Um, so this looks like about six cubic feet per hour. You see it says SCFH, that's standard cubic feet per hour. 
So this should be giving us our 99.5% purity. Now if I wanted lower purity but a higher flow rate, all I would do is loosen uh, this valve, this needle valve here, and you see the ball starts to float up. And once we get to about 19, which is about there, uh, then we should be making 95% purity. You also notice I've strapped my flow meter to a piece of wood with some zip ties just to keep it vertical. Uh, obviously you have to have it vertical to be able to read the little ball in there. And then finally, once the gas passes through the flow meter, it comes out this upper tube here and snakes around back and goes into my collection container, which in this case is a test tube. And this is all open because I don't want to develop any more pressure within the system if I can help it. So now that you've seen the setup, let's see if we can start collecting some gas. So let's turn on the air pressure up to 100 PSI. and get some gas flowing through the system. So now we're at about six. So one of the other cool things about this filter system is it does not take long at all before it starts working at full capacity. It's only a 30 second lead time before it's, it's ready to roll. So that's pretty awesome. So I'm gonna wait for 30 seconds now that I've dialed it down to our six cubic feet per hour rate. Once that's done, I'll have maximum purity going into my test tube here. Now, if you've seen one of my previous videos on lithium, I talked a little bit about gas purging. So in this case, I'm trying to purge all of the air out of that test tube by injecting this purified nitrogen into it. And to do an effective gas purge, I want to put in seven volumes of that container uh, worth of the new gas. And that will guarantee that we've gotten out all of the old gas. So all the regular air should be gone, and now all of our filtered air should be in there. All right, I've let this run long enough where the purity should be stabilized and we should have our seven volumes of purging gas complete. So let me take the tube out of here and put a stopper in there for a minute. Let's leave that off to the side. And so now let's try to test our gas. So if this is nitrogen, it should not support combustion. So I have a wooden splint over here that will light and try to immerse that in the gas and see what happens. And it goes out. So now we've shown that our retentate stream does not support combustion. And that means that there's very little, if any, oxygen present in it. So this being compressed air, the remainder should be just nitrogen. And that's what we should have. But of course, that test was not specific for nitrogen. There's lots of gases that don't support combustion. So we can at least eliminate one of them by doing the specific test for carbon dioxide, which is to bubble the gas through lime water. And I have prepared a fresh solution of lime water here. You can see it's crystal clear. And if there's any CO2 present in the gas stream, um, this liquid will go cloudy. So let's give that a shot. And we'll just let that bubble for a minute or two to see if anything happens. And it looks like that test is negative. So that means that this gas is not carbon dioxide. Now to show you what it does do, if it is carbon dioxide present, uh, I'll do another test with a straw and I'll just blow into the straw and the carbon dioxide that I exhale is gonna go into the solution and we should see it change. And that's a definitively positive test for carbon dioxide. So further evidence that our retentate stream is just pure nitrogen. So now that we've shown the nitrogen output stream is pretty pure, let's find out where the oxygen went. So I'll take my permeate stream and I'll grab the other end of this. So here's the other end of the permeate stream tube. So this is where our filtered oxygen should be exiting. So let's take that and put that in the test tube. 
Now I don't have a flow meter on this, so I'm not quite sure, you know, the speed that it's coming out of there. Uh, but it feels comparable to what's coming out of the nitrogen end. So let's just leave that in there for, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds or so. That should probably be enough. So now let's do the test for oxygen, which is where you have a lit splint and you blow it out so that there's a glowing ember on the end of it. And if this is indeed oxygen, it should relight. Look at that, it did. It doesn't stay relit because I think it's uh, not quite concentrated enough to do so. If you do that test with pure oxygen, it'll stay lit when you bring it back out. So it's not pure, but it's definitely more concentrated than in air. And that actually gets me thinking, let's try and figure out what the actual concentration of oxygen coming out of this thing really is. And I've got a cool experiment in mind to test that. Essentially what we're gonna do is burn something in a sealed container full of whatever gas we wanna test. And I'm gonna use a SEP funnel. Now this is not ideal for this sort of thing. Uh, the, usually the experiment is done with a round bottom flask with a stopper in it that has a tube going through the middle of it. But all of my stoppers don't fit very well. They, they're not airtight, so it's not gonna work for me. Uh, this, however, is pretty nice because it's got ground glass closures on both ends, and so it is very well airtight, and it's got a convenient little spout on the bottom for the second part of this. So what we're going to do is burn something in this volume and then allow water into it, and the water will displace the volume of gas that was burned up because when we burn something, we're consuming the oxygen, reducing the pressure inside the vessel, and then to compensate for that reduced pressure, the water will rush in to fill that space. And then we can measure the amount of water that was sucked in and compare that to the total volume of the container and have a percent value. So this is a bit tricky to do. We're going to use ethyl alcohol, which is just ethanol, regular drinking alcohol. And I have half of a cotton ball here that we're going to soak in that uh, rubbing alcohol. Because I don't want the fuel to be the limiting reagent. I want the oxygen to be. So we're gonna stick that into the set funnel here. And you'll notice I have it on its side. Uh, I tried this with it vertical, but if the cotton ball falls to the bottom here, it burns out pretty quickly. And I think it leaves a lot of oxygen uh, unburned up on the, the bulb there. So we're gonna try it this way. And the tricky part here is doing this quickly. So I want to light this cotton on fire and then put the stopper on very fast uh, to get the most accurate results. You also notice the stopcock is closed as well. So let's go ahead and give this a try. So we'll try to drop a match in there maybe. Oh. <laughs> so you saw, <laughs> you saw the stopper popped out there. That's something I was prepared for, but not well enough it seems. Uh, what happens is when you burn something in here, it, you know, it's got hot gases coming off of it. So that's going to increase the pressure initially, but then once it burns away the oxygen, the pressure then decreases, and so now we have a good vacuum seal there. So that little burp there might impact my results, but we'll see. So now I've got my sealed SEP funnel uh, suspended on a ring stand above a bowl of water, and what we're going to do is open the stopcock on the bottom and allow the water to be sucked up into it. And as I said before, that will displace the burned away oxygen and give us a volume we can work with. Now I waited a minute before I did this because you know the burning, like I said, it, it makes hot gases. So I want to wait for those gases to cool back down to room temperature to give us the most accurate reading. But now it looked like it's good to go. So we'll close the stopcock again. And at this point I can take the cap off the top of it since it's equilibrated. But now let's measure that volume. So now you see I've got my funnel suspended over a measuring cylinder. So let's see what volume of water was drawn into it. I'll pan down so you can actually see that volume. And that is 154 milliliters. Now, if we compare that to the total volume of the SEP funnel, which is 630 milliliters, 
that ends up being 24.4%. Um, so that's the volume of oxygen that was consumed. Air is supposed to be 21%, so it looks like we overshot it by a few percent, and that might be due to that, that little burp that happened in the beginning. But not too bad, really. So now I've routed my permeate stream into the SEP funnel, and we're gonna let it purge for a minute or so to fill it up with our permeate gas, which is our oxygen-enriched stream, and then we'll repeat that test I just did for the atmosphere and see if this gives us anything different. The tricky part with doing this with the oxygen stream, of course, is now I want to keep this gas contained as much as possible. So I got to go quick with just putting this in. Okay, that's our ethanol soaked cotton ball. Now let's light a match and throw that in as well. Oh, good. That time I was better prepared for the burp. <laughs> it did look like it burned a little longer, so that's good. Okay, good to go. Now I'll go ahead and let the water in. Certainly looks like it filled up more. And now to measure the volume. This time around the cotton ball got soaked with water so I need to squeeze the water out of that to get the most accurate reading. And that should add a few milliliters. And it looks like we're left with 216 milliliters. So if we do 216 milliliters divided by the 630 milliliter total volume, we get 34.3% oxygen. It's definitely an increase. So I repeated those tests several times and here's all the data that I collected. So for just plain old air, we averaged about 22.8% oxygen. And the quoted value, as I said, is 21%, so it's actually pretty close, so I'm pretty pleased with that. Uh, for the permeate stream, when I set the output flow rate for 99.5% nitrogen, we get an average of 39% oxygen, which is quite a bit higher. And then finally, for the permeate stream, when I set the output flow rate to 95% nitrogen, which is the faster flow rate, if you remember, I actually get 45.1% oxygen, so that's even higher still. Now that actually seemed a little counterintuitive to me at first, but the way they explained it to me is this. When the retentate flow is higher, and thus its oxygen concentration is also higher, the gas in the fibers throughout the filter also has more oxygen in it to permeate. The oxygen level in the permeate, which is what I'm measuring here, it depends on the average partial pressure of oxygen in the fibers, which averages higher when the retentate output has more oxygen still in it. Thus, the lower purity setting, that bottom table there, should have more oxygen in it than the higher purity setting, which is the top table. And they also said that they would expect about 40% oxygen at the 95% nitrogen setting, and only 29% at the 99.5% setting, which is quite a bit lower than what I measured. And I think that's just due to the crudeness of my experimental setup. I mean, as you saw, sometimes it's hard to keep the pressure in there, and it's also hard to light a match, throw it in there, put the cap back on. You know, you're gonna lose some uh, gas doing it that way. So it's not 100% accurate. But I think it's, it's clear that the permeate stream does in, in fact give you enriched oxygen over what air is. So it proves that the filter does in fact work, which is really cool. So that's about it for this video. Thanks very much for sticking around to the very end. 
And another big thank you to Generon for sending me this module to test out for you guys. It was a lot of fun to work with, and it was cool to get introduced to some new technology that I had really never heard of before. And of course, thanks to you guys for watching, as always.